This game is great. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is kind of like Dark Souls. It's also kind of like Uncharted, The Last of Us, Metroid Prime, and God of War 2018. A lot has been said about Fallen Order, and I can see where both major camps are coming from when appraising it. Is it simply a mismatch of ideas and popular game mechanics thrown into a high-budget Star Wars vehicle? Is it a good game in its own right that deserves some slack? Uh, both, I think, are true to an extent. Yes, it is pretty wild how much Fallen Order resembles many other games, be it in small and big ways. And yes, it definitely feels like a modern action-adventure title, with all the quality-of-life niceties, detailed graphics, and similar gameplay features that come along with them. Regardless of how unoriginal it might feel in certain areas, however, it's a surprisingly solid game, and it gets better and better as it goes on. Over the years, I've actually played the first hour or two close to four or five times now, and it never clicked, but being forced to play more of it finally showed me that, yes, this game is good. In fact, in some ways, it's more than good. Before actually getting into the thick of things, I'll simply say up front that three or four particular moments in Fallen Order were so great, they're practically worth the price of admission on their own. Well, the build-up to them is what makes them so good, but you get it. If you like Star Wars and haven't played this game yet, I'd say you should duck out when I preface the first of the three or four great moments, which will be at around this time in the video. That or skip ahead when I say so. All that said, there's no denying how samey Fallen Order feels at times. I can kind of get why people might not be able to view this game as anything more than a clinical and stilted, maybe even soulless, Star Wars-skinned high-budget action-adventure title. I do think that's being overly harsh, but I can see where they're coming from. So much of Fallen Order seems stitched together from other games. What stuck out the most for me was its shared DNA with God of War 2018, which is a shame since that's my least favorite of the games I mentioned earlier. It's funny, since I doubt EA and Respawn purposely modeled their game after God of War, it didn't have that much time to influence it, Fallen Order only came out a year later. No, I think it just speaks to the current state of AAA single-player games and the obvious rut that they're in. Skill trees which aren't very deep, just a way to stagger ability unlocks given that you'll likely acquire almost all of them at some point, a non-linear way of presenting levels, letting the player explore the highly detailed world a bit, but not too much. A little companion guide that helps out with a few things, one that the main character can talk to here and there to vocalize their inner thoughts, overt puzzle-solving sections where you use your abilities and brain to solve some very basic brain teasers, even offering hints if you take too long, secrets and collectibles scattered all around, the total number being presented to you on the map screen so you can slowly work towards finding them all, the times where you're meant to just walk around while listening to your companions or radio chatter. A few that are much more God of War specific, there are two types of dodges, a quick sidestep and a more exaggerated roll that clears more distance, enemies turning red to delineate which attacks can be blocked or not, climbing on obviously climbable vines and grates, and unlocking shortcuts, even ones that have you lowering down a rope of some kind. Some of that could easily be attributed to other games, such as Metal Gear Rising Revengeance with the colored enemy attacks, The Last of Us with the companion helper, Uncharted with the basic ledge climb platforming, and skill trees are in everything these days, so maybe Horizon or Spider-Man had a hand in influencing Fallen Order's tree, too. Unlocking shortcuts is very common in the Dark Souls series, especially considering the method in which most of them open up, opening doors and elevators from one side. The combat is very much a Dark Souls affair, not a whole lot of attacks at your disposal, but the emphasis is instead on not taking damage and being thoughtful with your attacks and dodges. I mean, at least more thoughtful than you might in some other action games, anyway. Other Dark Souls influences include the bonfire checkpoint system and all that comes with it. When you rest at one, your limited number of healing items refill, enemies respawn, and you can spend your experience leveling up your character, except in this case it's a skill tree instead of individual stats. You also lose some of that experience when you die, having to attack the enemy that killed you to retrieve it, or grab it if you fell off the environment or something one too many times. Moving past the soul similarities, audio logs are present in Fallen Order, which has become a very traditional method of doling out bits of backstory and lore. If we want to take it even further, Cal slides down slopes frequently, which was in the Tomb Raider reboot games, and further refined into a recurring gameplay bit in Uncharted 4. On that note, many of Fallen Order's grand set-piece moments felt reminiscent, such as the train action sequence in the beginning, and the swinging on vines and ropes were in a few of Naughty Dog's games as well. Wall running could be attributed to Titanfall 2 or Mirror's Edge for recent examples, but a more one-to-one -one comparison would be the Prince of Persia trilogy. There's also the fake balance beam bits, where you have no chance of falling, which seems to be a hit with modern developers as it shows up in a ton of games. 
hey, at least in Hellblade, you're allowed to fall off. I think you get the picture. Jedi Fallen Order borrows many ideas and combines them together to make a Star Wars adventure that feels somewhat unique when comparing it to its licensed brethren, but all too familiar when viewing it in the scope of action-adventure games as a whole. I think this is the main reason some disregard Fallen Order as anything more than a mediocre outing, another in the long line of modern AAA sludge that gets released multiple times a year, most of which, naturally, get nominated for Game of the Year somehow. Big budgets to make the game look pretty, while jamming in every popular game mechanic and quality of life feature out there to appeal to as wide a demographic as possible to recoup the costs of making the game so pretty. It's a cycle that's as vicious as it is demonstrably successful. While I can easily admit that Fallen Order doesn't feel all that distinct, I do think it's a decent game. I don't usually go out of my way to see what other critics think before making my videos, but I did this time, and I have to say, the hyper-focus on originality is a bit tiring. Quite literally, every work of art is inspired by something else, we're all copies of a copy, and everything we make is like something that already exists. Wanting every gaming experience to satisfy a selfish desire to see something new, something unique, will only lead to disappointment since it's just not feasible. It's also not very fair, either. Creating something wholly original is near impossible, but even lowering the bar to a game that brings new ideas to the table, I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds. It also simply might not be what they want to do. Miyazaki and FromSoft have received similar criticisms within the same vein, and while I can understand wanting another Demons and Dark Souls-like battering of contemporary conventions, it's just not fair. Some of the more quirky yet endearing characteristics of those early games stemmed directly from Miyazaki's own real-world experiences, and demanding he eke out another epiphany seemingly from out of nowhere, it's just, it's not how art works. Plus, more power to him, artists should be allowed to do whatever the hell they want, and if he's content with making poison swamps, even excited at the prospect, absolutely go off, man. All of this is why it's fairly easy to mostly look past all of the samey game design decisions. Saying it feels like a different title is only a fun talking point for so many minutes, it's a discussion that gets boring really fast. Moving past that, I also found Fallen Order to be a nice little Star Wars story in its own right. Initially, I was very much not engaged with the characters and narrative, but it grew on me, and I started to see it as a solid Star Wars adventure. There's a decent mix of seriousness and comedy that made it feel like what the Star Wars films were able to provide at their best. I'm not in love with the decision to stay within the very tired, pre-Death Star, post-Order 66 time period, though, but I think I've made my peace with the fact that for the rest of my natural life, Disney will continue to create more and more side stories that took place within this era, milking Vader, Stormtroopers, and the Emperor with no end in sight. Oh god, do I miss the Old Republic. There is a caveat to what I just said, however, as something happened near the end that made me not only content with the time period decision, but surprisingly happy with it. We're not there yet, though. You know how we do things on this channel. Gameplay first. While the combat isn't quite as engaging as I'd like it to be, both for regular enemies and boss fights, I can't complain too much. You have a lightsaber, can even make it a double blade, and can force push and pull. That's the dream for a Star Wars game, and we would have killed to have something like this when I was a kid, so I can't act like I'm above it or anything. That said, though, I can't pretend I was in love with it either. The beginning, especially, when you're left with the basic essentials, felt very one-dimensional. Even though the combat in the Souls games is relatively simple on the whole, it made up for it with its plethora of weapons, spells, stats, and other such RPG elements to let players craft their own build. There's also a lot of ways you could go right away, with different enemy variants depending on the area. Well, Fallen Order of course has none of that, so on the surface, it felt a bit watered down. A mostly linear track through some sectioned off levels, and you have the usual troopers and animals to fight, without much in the way of customization or an interesting moveset. After you get a bit further into the game, however, you could view it the opposite way. Given that stats and builds are only ever managed through a menu and don't grant more decisions when in combat, barring certain exceptions, the fact that Fallen Order eventually sees you unlocking a few combos, weapon switching attacks, and force powers, all being available to use at a moment's notice, in addition to always having a block and a parry maneuver in every combat encounter, there is, in all honesty, more ways to approach a group of enemies than simply mashing R1 while dodging and or holding up your guard. The latter is still very much on the table if that's your preference, and like I said, is what you'll be going with for most of the first half of the game, sadly. But later on, your options start to open up. You'll be able to force push enemies off cliffs, which is always funny, push grenades and rockets back at them, force pull soldiers into your saber, bonk enemies into each other depending on the type, throw your lightsaber, seamlessly switch between a single and double blade with a unique attack, do a stronger overhead swing with its own two-hit combo, perform a sprinting slash, 
a charging gap closer, an area of effect attack where you throw your saber around you, a forceful jumping slam which knocks foes back, and there's even the Devil May Cry-esque pause slash combo where you get a different moveset when waiting a second or two after your first swing. Parrying reduces enemy stamina which can lead to stylish death blows, but best of all, a well-timed block can send enemy gunfire back at them. On the whole, combat encounters are generally a pretty fun time, especially when considering a cool thing I'll discuss later, but it's hard to shake the feeling that something isn't right. Ignoring every force power and unlockable combo, the Dark Souls combat feels pretty boring, and because most of your interesting arsenal is optional, none of the enemies or scenarios feel designed around them. The only trooper that feels distinct is the Rocket Trooper, given that they're more or less tuned around the force push. Every enemy with the Blaster Bolt, even ATSTs and Bounty Hunters, just deflect their lasers. Doing anything else is punished. Parrying at the right time, something easy to do, made trivial with the double blade, is the obvious choice. Sure, with melee guys thrown in, it's a little trickier, but not by much. They, too, just need a good parry and an instant melee kill to be tossed aside. It's just a shame. There's so many fun things here, but not much reason to use them. For instance, the lightsaber throw, ground pound, and area of effect lightsaber circular attack were things I only use when gathering footage or directly after acquiring them to see how they work. You'd think lightsaber throws would be perfect for those long-range soldiers, right? No, just deflect their blaster. Not only is it a simpler action, taking your inputs into account, and your saber's reach won't even be long enough under normal circumstances, but most importantly, one of them costs force to use while the other doesn't. It's a decision that makes itself, and will make itself time and time again in almost every single combat encounter. The only exceptions being red unblockable attacks and rocket launcher troopers. Awesome. With force being the ammo for fun attacks, and it not regenerating on its own early on, I suppose you can't require a player to be creative, which kind of makes every combat encounter blur together in your memory. Again, certain elements do make up for that fact, which I'll be getting to later. Now that we can focus on the core combat of attacking, blocking, dodging, and parrying, there's another way in which the game felt wrong as I was playing, but I couldn't put my finger on it. A general unresponsiveness and clunky vibe that I couldn't pin down. I don't want to get into how many rounds of testing and rewriting this section had, but let's just say, up until the last couple days of editing, this script was still being worked on. There's a surprising amount of nuance to the combat, but not in the way that's actually interesting. Basically, when you get smacked with a sun baton, which is practically what all melee enemies hold, there's a split second where you can't pull up your guard or dodge. With almost every normal enemy encounter in the game, this won't be noticeable, as all of them have stupidly slow attacks. Only when you deliberately try and test for this stuff with a huge group of them is it noticeable. Where it's the most obvious is with specific purge troopers, and these guys are what made me start down this rabbit hole of investigations. More than likely, a player will encounter this light stun lock from the staff guy and the dual baton guy, as they each have a combo chain that prevents you from doing anything after you get hit once with it. The staff dude is pretty one note, he doesn't have much more of a part to play in this story. This dual baton guy, however, is how all this got started. Yes, he has the quick flurry combo which unlocks you, but what's more, if you deflect any one of his attacks, he'll do an extremely quick counterswing in response. He's the only enemy that does this. On Grandmaster difficulty, it's surprisingly easy to parry these until he runs out of stamina, three being the magic number on higher difficulties. However, when testing the differences between the double blade and single, I noticed something odd. With the double blade, you literally can't deflect these counter swings. You won't take damage, but even after lowering it to story mode and Jedi Knight, I couldn't get two deflections in a row, let alone all three. This led me to think that the double blade was special somehow, which did go along with my previous findings. In a controlled environment, it seemed like the double-bladed swing ended a hair quicker than the single equivalent, meaning you could pull up your guard faster, as you have overall less commitment with every press of the attack button. Maybe that's why the double blade felt easier to use in combat. I still think that has something to do with it, but when it comes to the timing for the parry, I had no answers. It felt entirely normal when using it with a group of enemies, but then I realized, no, this can't possibly be right. I already knew if you deflected a blaster bolt back with a double blade out, you could simply hold down the block button and any and all blaster fire afterwards within a certain time window would get smacked back at the enemies without hassle. It is a cool visual, but in my opinion, it makes certain encounters entirely trivial. Deflecting gunfire is already fairly overpowered in my eyes, so not even having to time the button press for each individual blaster bolt felt wrong. That said, at least that was sectioned off to the ranged combat side of things right? That's what the tutorial thing says when acquiring it. 
Well, it turns out that advantage carries over to the melee combat. That group of foes I was using as my test dummies? Yep, you can parry all their attacks if their swings are close enough to each other with a single button press and hold. Oh god. I wonder how often this happened without me even realizing it elsewhere? I can't imagine too much, since I went my whole first playthrough without remembering that the deflection cheese was a thing in the first place, and there were no accidental uses of it there, so I doubt it gave me any benefits without me knowing. That said, there's a small idiosyncrasy that I noticed while doing this that may or may not be a knock-on effect, and may or may not have aided or hurt me in my first playthrough. If you parry successfully with a double blade in a group of enemies, even if the next incoming attack is too late for the chain deflection to take over, you still avoid damage as Cal keeps his guard up from the L1 press. He doesn't do that with the single blade. I parry, keep holding L1, and he takes damage. Wild, wild stuff. However, not as wild as this dual baton purge trooper. Why is he the only enemy that has a counter swing? Why can't you deflect them with a double blade? Madness. If you die to this guy, know that there's nothing to be ashamed of. He's a very special boy, the most unique enemy in the game. Besides the obviously annoying hitbox issues and other such technical problems that pop up now and then, there's one objective flaw to the combat, in my opinion anyway, as oxymoronic as that is, and that comes down to the dumbfounding issue with jumping while holding block. If you don't know the trick to this, this fucking ridiculously stupid limitation, you'll likely take damage during fights where the boss has an attack you have to jump over. Basically, if you hold block when targeting an enemy, not when just out and about, pressing jump won't do anything, the game won't let you do it. You have to either dodge first, or get hit while still holding block, then in that current holding up of your guard, you can jump as much as you want. I didn't know about that idiosyncrasy in my main playthrough, however, that's only what I learned after my time with the game when testing things out for this script. In multiple boss fights, including the final one, which I won't show on screen right now, I took damage because I instinctively held up my guard while trying to jump. I guess the moral is to keep your guard down when in transitional states? Kind of a weird lesson, since that's very much not how it works in the Souls games, which Fallen Order obviously takes most of its cues from. That's something else that was on my mind, how hilariously unfortunate it was that Sekiro came out when it did, as Fallen Order didn't have time to copy that game instead of Dark Souls. Imagining Sekiro's boss battle combat but with lightsabers instead of swords sounds like a match made in heaven. There are a couple fights where it does feel pretty damn close, but they're few and far between, and still don't hit that perfection that Sekiro's posture system provided with its best fights. Both games encourage a defensive mindset, but Fallen Order doesn't really have as much urgency and tension during tough encounters, given that you're mostly taking away their health bar. Someone could easily make the case that you do a similar thing with the boss's stamina as you would in Sekiro with the opponent's posture, but I disagree. Sekiro it was a sometimes grueling and butt-clenching process. You really had to keep on the pressure and stay disciplined for a lengthy amount of time. That would pay off with a full health bar being removed though, whereas in Fallen Order, the time it takes to get their stamina empty is far shorter, and does comparatively less damage to them. On paper it may look the same, but just more frequently and less demanding, but that really makes all the difference. One is a gauntlet, a battle against complacency, one that gets more and more exhausting and nerve-wracking as it goes on. The other is a battle with many miniature victories, every time their guard goes down you get some hits in, even though with many bosses you can get hits in at other points too. The level of determination you need in Sekiro isn't really present with Fallen Order, which could be a good thing for many people. I'm not specifically criticizing it, since that's not really fair, just pointing out why I view them as different. The only way in which Fallen Order really resembles Sekiro, in my opinion, is with the regular enemies, as dwindling low-ranking goobers on-screen stamina bar to get a one-hit kill feels very familiar. I wouldn't blame anyone for drawing the conclusion that it did, in fact, copy Sekiro, but there's just no way. That's not nearly enough time in game development these days. Even if that wasn't the case, what I just referenced was the worst part of the Sekiro combat for me, so Fallen Order really isn't winning me over there. The boss fights and many boss battles were where the posture system really shined, and there's not much in Fallen Order, except one or two exceptions, that comes close to scratching that itch. Not to be constantly comparing Fallen Order to Sekiro or anything, as most of what constitutes a boss fight in this game would barely pass for a D-tier's Dark Souls boss. Four of them are simply larger or more aggressive variants of some type of fauna in each world. There's the silly bounty hunters, a couple of awesome lightsaber duels, and a decent scuffle with a giant flying beast. That's already a very low number, but considering there's really only four or five good ones, two of them being the same fight, 
all of them being mandatory, and the majority being held back until the final third of the game? Eh, quality over quantity, sure, but I would have liked to see a bit more in the enemy department. In fact, the overall enemy variety is so poor, when you're captured and forced to entertain a crowd in a gladiatorial arena of sorts, you know what you have to fight off? The very same creatures you've come across so far, specifically from Zepho, Kashyyyk, and Bogana, and the worst one from Dathomir, I guess. Wow, what are the odds that this maniacal debt collector guy decided to take from those planets to fill his combat cages, even Bogano, a planet that nobody else knows about except Seer and BD-1? Just goes to show that they really wanted to be sure a player was comfortable with the enemy lineup it had planned for them here, which made this section feel pretty lame. It's such a shame, too, as the music and introduction made me think something big was underway. It's the same song that was playing in Cal's ear back at the opening of the game. Hey, I recognize this band. I figured this would be some gigantic detour, or some crazy enemies I haven't seen yet, but... Nah, just a few rounds of animals you've already seen, then a bounty hunter, and that's it. Ugh. Initially, I was kind of bummed to see so many regular animals being fed to Cal as genuine threats early on. It felt like I was killing more native creatures in Fallen Order than in Monster Hunter at times, but I will admit, it made the inner forest section of Kashyyyk all the better, and the same can be said about the wastes of Dathomir. It was a fun shift, going from, oh, these pesky animals can be a nuisance, I tell ya, to, Holy shit, nothing can survive down in these pits of despair. The flowers even want you dead. The ground can swallow you whole. Fucking hell, this stormtrooper had its brain sucked out by a giant spider. Get me the fuck out of here. The stormtroopers go from easily fending off Skaz on Zepho to being decimated by giant spiders on Kashyyyk. It touches on the light themes of the Empire expanding too far and too thin for their own good, sacrificing soldiers in their attempts at spreading to as many worlds as possible. Enslaving the Wookiees is one thing, but trying to tame the nightmares that live on the inner forest shadowlands of Kashyyyk is a whole other story. Maybe that's why there wasn't a hint of stormtrooper activity on Dathomir. That place is inhospitable to everything except the deranged and mentally strong. There's something inspiring about that fact, though. Whether it be to lack of interest or its sharp teeth being intimidating, the Empire hasn't yet fucked with Dathomir. As much as it is dark and depressing, and its goddamn animals are irritating beyond comprehension, those little bastards who shoot acid can burn in hell for all eternity, it should be viewed as a win in the grand scheme of things. One fewer planet for the space Nazis to occupy. Going back to the enemies, I really enjoyed the Zepho Tomb Guardians. Slicing into their big bulky bodies with a lightsaber and dodging their exaggerated attacks felt great. More enemies with large and obvious offensive moves would have been welcome. Too many were small and agile. Some of the purge troopers were fun, the staff-wielding ones being my favorite, along with the hammer dingus who pounds the ground. They almost pretended to be mini-bosses at times, but they aren't, at least not in my opinion. Similarly, the ATSTs are delusional enough to present themselves as a full-fledged boss fight, but I'm not counting them, just like I don't count the single security droid as a boss either. The ATSTs are fine, maybe a little too easy when you get the hang of the combat, but the best part about them, by far, is the adorable pilot trooper that gets spat out of the top. His perseverance is admirable, he still tries to take you down afterwards. What a champ. Those were the only regular enemies I wanted to highlight. When it comes to the bosses, the real ones anyway, I think the decision to place one of the four legendary beast encounters right at the beginning, easily accessible on Bogana, was a bad move. I threw my head against this immovable wall for quite some time, getting annoyed at the horrible load times, where if I had known this was one of four of the toughest beasts in the game, I likely would have come back later when I got the hang of the game a bit more. His relentless offense felt almost laughable when first starting out. I remember thinking, if this is what the game is, maybe I shouldn't even be playing it. I can put up with difficult boss fights, but when they're just a big bouncy blob and the load times are so long, it's hard to even give a shit. Ignoring Braca, this guy can be your literal second or third enemy in the game, before the regular version of these enemies make their appearance even, and before you acquire your healing items. I'm sure some players out there like that he's a challenge you can take on right away, so I'll stop complaining about it and move on. Out of the four bigger boys, I liked the albino wish shock the most. Hard to really say why, though. Maybe giant spiders just freak me out so much that killing one feels great regardless of what game I'm in. Oh, we are the Bounty hunters, when one-on-one, -on -one, just parry their lasers and that's mostly it, not much. The ambushes here and there in seemingly random locations are fine, I suppose, but still nothing incredible. 
My favorite was with the large and in-charge droid bounty hunter with its human sidekick, since they're placed in an area where you can line them up and force push them into an insta-kill hazard. The humongous Gorgara flying beast in Dathomir is the best non-lightsaber boss fight by a country mile. This one felt like it could have been a real Dark Souls boss, which is pretty high praise given the others I mentioned so far. Its presence alone is intimidating, and the attacks all felt fair, and were imposing enough to at least look ferocious and hard to manage on the outset. The set piece afterwards, where you have to climb up a wall to escape, then fly onto its back, isn't amazing, sure, but it's not that bad, jeez, who cares. Finally, there are the sister lightsaber duels, and these are so good they almost make up for the lack of quantity and quality with the other bosses. Again, just thinking about these, but with a more obvious Sekiro approach, Oh yeah, fucking hell, that sounds awesome. Get from South to make a Star Wars game. In all honesty, like I said, these do feel pretty reminiscent, as you'll be parrying multiple strikes in a row, dodging when necessary, and sneaking in damage-dealing strikes when possible. The second sister's duel in Zepho Round 2 is pretty good, but I particularly love the ninth sister's fight, and I'll give a warning to anyone that hasn't played the game before that this is one of the three or four moments I said were almost worth the price of admission on their own. I'd advise you to either skip here, or fuck off if you have interest in playing this game without being spoiled. The fight itself is great, it's a classic duel between two Saber users. What makes it special, though, comes down to the pacing and the reveal. She starts out with a single Saber, and then when you slap her around a bit, she tries to be a badass, I guess, and reveals her double blade. Except, you also have a double blade at this point, and if you're anything like me, who values a great cinematic shot, you'll decide that now is the perfect time to activate your double blade, slightly matching her fighting style, while also letting her know that her little display here, this taunt to get in Cal's head, was entirely ineffective. This moment was simply perfect, and what makes it so cool is that everyone has the opportunity to do exactly what I did, yet the players who got to this point will be split into three distinct camps, potentially without them even knowing it at the time. There's three places you can acquire the double-bladed lightsaber. One method is by visiting Dathomir early, one is by returning to Bogana after you fix BD-1 scomp links on Zepho, and the third way, if all other optional means have so far eluded the player, is a mandatory acquisition at the top of the origin tree, mere moments before the Ninth Sister boss fight begins. The game even forces you into the cutscene if you try to walk by, it's kind of funny. I can easily imagine a player feeling that same level of badassery when igniting their double blade in this moment, but with a slightly different take on the situation. If you had just obtained it at the tree, maybe it's a, let's give this new weapon a proper field test. If you had gotten it from Bogano, maybe there's a hint of sentimentality to it. After all, there is a small cutscene when you get it here, where Cal talks about keeping a small part of Cordova with him by combining Eno's hilt to his. For me, I got the double blade early on Dathomir, and thus had it nearly my entire playthrough, so my mindset was more along the lines of, Sister, you have no idea who you're messing with. You could also, sadly, already have the double blade activated during the intro cutscene, and kind of ruin that perfect moment for yourself. Then again, maybe that's another fun experience, the ninth sister matching your fighting style. Perhaps for those players, she's finally giving you the respect you deserve in that moment, no longer wishing to gimp herself intentionally. Also, yes, if you ascribe to Bane's teachings, a double blade is an inferior style of lightsaber combat, as you always know where the other side is when only focusing on one blade, it's just a mind game to fuck with your opponent, but ignore that legend's lore for now. Double blades are awesome, and this moment rocked. A small personal footnote, knowing how often I kept my saber in the double blade setting, I'm extremely thankful I, for some reason, had it on the single blade when this fight started. What a crazy stroke of luck. One last bit of praise towards this fight, besides it being a solid as hell battle all around, it both foreshadows and calls back in the same encounter. Some of these moves you'll see, particularly the lightsaber throw and area of effect maneuver you have to jump over, are moves that the second sister uses in your final confrontation with her, so the ninth sister is subtly training you on her comrade's arsenal of attacks, inadvertently training Cal to take her down. The callback is with the dialogue beforehand. In the beginning of the game, a seemingly random and on-the-nose line triggers when you slide down this slope. You are not approved trash. You trash? She's not approved trash. Cal knows he's trash. Either a bit of deprecating humor about his scrapper status and the setting around him for players to either laugh at or ignore, or a rather blunt way of telling us that Cal doesn't think of himself too highly. By the Ninth Sister fight, Cal has come a long way, and now it seems he views himself a bit differently. Not bad for trash! What about for a Jedi? Is there a difference? 
her retort afterwards, if you didn't remember the line from Cal in the beginning, might make you think that she got the last word in, that she won this exchange, but she didn't. Cal knows his worth. King shit. Overall, this ninth sister boss was truly great stuff. A surprise to be sure, but a... Uh, I'm not doing the fan service line, go fuck yourself. I'll talk about the other bosses later, don't worry. Something else that was an absolute delight to see it relates to the enemies once more. Enemy factions can engage and fight with each other, and all attacks seem to be fair game for everyone on screen. Since I've already uncharitably compared Fallen Order to Sekiro earlier, I should bring balance to the force a bit with another comparison. In that game, I was pretty bummed that I couldn't pit certain foes against each other, specifically the troll and the surrounding doofuses in the beginning. I'm sorry, I'll never let that go. I realize they're hinting at using fire, but they clearly talk about having to fight him and being worried about it. In Fallen Order, you can throw an astromech droid into stormtroopers, deflect blaster bolts from one guy and hit a different one, lure a probe droid and have it blow up someone on his team instead of you, and the same works for the stormtrooper grenade throws. You can force push rockets back at them, killing an entire group, force push one type of fauna into another, force pull a trooper into a Shadowlands floor plant, or hack a security droid and watch them duke it out. Often you'll see the Empire at war with the Zepho Tomb Guardians and the local hostile creatures of both Zepho and Kashyyyk. Once I even got all of us to work together, kinda, to take down a Jotaz on Zepho. On Dathomir, the Night Brothers can get distracted and fend off the fauna there too, and the Undead Sisters can even go after the Lesser Nidak. Many of these are presented as if you're walking into the middle of an operation or conflict, which makes it really fun. You could argue it's not as organic as it could be, since the majority of them are quite clearly placed in specific spots and mostly begin fighting when you're close enough, but I'm not looking for a simulated immersive experience here. I'm more than happy to see Respawn litter the levels with tiny set-piece events that bring the Star Wars setting to life. It really sells me on the idea that I'm not the only living thing that has agency in this game world, that the Empire are doing what the game tells you they're doing, invading these planets, either fighting off and enslaving the natives, or trying desperately to uncover their secrets, after having offloaded all of the inhabitants long before. The only thing that slightly bothered me was how nonsensical some of the terrain was, which is par for the course for a solid Metroid-style game. You gotta get the players to utilize their skills and powers after all, but it makes it all the more strange to see soldiers in areas that were difficult for even a Jedi to reach. They sometimes show a dropship aircraft of sorts that fly in and let out an enemy or two, so maybe that's it, but I don't know. Either way, stumbling onto these small skirmishes is always enjoyable, not only because it's a fun spectacle that makes the game world feel more lived in, but it creates a decision for the player. Maybe if enough people ask me, I could get convinced to do a proper Last of Us Part 2 review, but one of the best parts of that game is when zombies and humans are in the same area, and it's up to you to take advantage of that fact. Once you get them close and all hell breaks out, you have a choice. Help the zombies, help the humans, or do nothing. That little dilemma has a lot more to it than meets the eye, and it's already a three-pronged decision. Doing nothing lets them duke it out as much as possible. This could save you resources, as maybe taking some easy shots on a few of them would be a waste, as they would have died in the scuffle you caused anyway, and revealing yourself early on might draw them towards you. However, if one side is winning, perhaps you might throw a wrench in their plans and turn the tides, causing the battle to shift the opposite way. Or you could assess which of the two factions is more of a threat to you right now. On higher difficulties, every bullet and individual use of a tool matters, so maybe you prefer to let one side win over the other, since the remains of a zombie grouping is easier to handle than the remains of a human force. It's great. The gameplay of The Last of Us Part II is incredible. There isn't quite as much here in Fallen Order, obviously, but that choice still pervaded my mind when encountering a few of these. After my first thought of, okay, this is rad as hell, my next thoughts were, who is currently winning? and which enemies are easier to handle solo once the winner stands tall. As much as this can pay off, you may end up making the wrong choice. On Kashyyyk, I made a bad call and helped the creatures, and was left with a two-on-one with a somewhat difficult foe. On Dathomir, I made the opposite choice, which also bit me in the ass, as the Night Brothers all grouped up on me. Other times I was just passing through, so I tried to give the Stormtroopers a hand by force pulling the Tomb Guardian's core out for them. It usually wasn't enough to swing the tides in their favor, but hey, I tried. The one exception to all of this seems to be the flowers in the Shadowlands. They definitely go for you, but they don't seek out anyone else. Watch as they have no interest in the trooper nearby, even though I desperately try to feed him to them. Lame. But ignoring that, the rest of what I talked about is great. One downside that's hard to ignore with all of this, though, is how often you may encounter a few of these specific scenarios a couple times over. 
Since Fallen Order is taking its cues from Metroid and Dark Souls, enemies reset when you rest at a checkpoint. I really don't like how much this clashes with the already established setting of Star Wars, as yeah, in Dark Souls there's more room for a death mechanic to make sense. It fits with the themes the game was going for, the canonical nature of your never-ending life is presented early, and everything never truly dying is a symptom of hollowing or something. Listen, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. The game world and lore were built with it in mind. Star Wars, however, wasn't. Cal Kestis coming back to life repeatedly just doesn't work. Some may argue that it's the same as any other game with a checkpoint system, except it's not, though. Items you've acquired via opening of chests, shortcuts you've unlocked, and bits of backstory you've learned about that show up on your menu stay put. Those actions you performed in a previous life, one which eventually ended for Cal, are permanent. They happened. An even easier example to point to is the dialogue from NPCs, either by radio or even bosses. They know they already told you the information once, they aren't going to do it again. Yes, you could definitely make the case that these aren't necessarily trappings of the Souls-like or Metroid genres, but instead quality of life features to ease a player's frustrations after death. After all, hearing the same exact dialogue over and over might feel like the game is taunting you in a way, and given that you're more likely to be very annoyed when they would have played again, since you've just died over and over, maybe it's a good thing they don't make you listen to it once more. Sure, I can see all of that, but regardless of what it is, it just made the deliberately placed encounters, be it a large-scale skirmish or even one as mundane as the two skazes fighting over the same stormtrooper body throughout the whole game in this one section for all eternity, a little less cool. This one especially felt odd, since they could have easily had a visual storytelling bit where this corpse you saw the skaz fighting over in your first visit instead had his legs torn off or otherwise eaten while you were away. I absolutely get you can't simulate the time Cal has been away from these planets whenever the mood strikes the player to go explore somewhere else, but there are two times in which Cal arrives in Zepho for story reasons, part one where he eventually learns Force Push, and part two where he eventually learns Force Pull. The second outing is broken up by a mandatory Kashyyyk trek, so why not change up the environment a little at that point in the game to make it seem like time was truly passing, even if the only acknowledged time elapses are story-based. To be clear, again, I don't give a shit about how all these events are happening without established time passing of some kind, it doesn't matter to me at all here. If you're fresh off the heels of my Dead Island video, or maybe even Dying Light, I think it's worth pointing out why it's important in some games how much time is passing, and in others it doesn't matter as much. While we are in a race against the Empire to get the MacGuffin for most of it, nothing about the story or dialogue points to a time limit or even worse, a literal impossible timeline of events thanks to a later DLC. Sure, Trilla does mention time running out to some extent on Zepho, but that's not real. We can tell she's just messing with us and trying to set up a trap. No, there's no pretending. Nothing about the story is overtly time-sensitive. We can easily suspend our disbelief that this Star Wars adventure is working on proper fantasy logic. Yes, by the way, Star Wars is fantasy set in space, not sci-fi. Zombies and magic are obviously fair game. Like, what do you think the Force is? Anyway, even more, nothing in the game ever hints that your exploratory secret hunting ways might be a hindrance to the mission. Seer and Grease even mention at different points that it wouldn't be a bad idea to further explore areas we've already been to, and I can't say I disagree with them too strongly. The levels in this game are far less open, and in the grand scheme, far smaller than some of the other games I've mentioned. Not just the zombie games, but even God of War 2018. Venturing back and exploring already seen areas isn't as much of a hassle here, given the lack of sprawl. That's saying a lot too, by the way. This game doesn't have a fast travel. Kudos to Respawn. Sure, you might only find a stupid poncho or mantis skin, but you could also increase your power through the classic Metroid-style energy and life upgrades. Considering Cal is the only Jedi available to fight off the Empire in this quest, yeah, maybe prepping him as much as possible is a good thing, actually. The only way in which the illusion started to fade was with the constant flying back and forths between planets. Not in the framework of time passing, no, it's actually kind of nuts how fast we go from the planet's surface, outer space, light speed, then arrive at the next area. As silly as that is, and as much as I would have enjoyed more time on the ship if it meant hearing some more crew dialogue along the way, instead my mind was on the fuel that powers this spacecraft. They kind of addressed this in a bit of dialogue, saying Seer pays the bills, but I'm still skeptical. I'd imagine if this weren't a video game and were real, Grease would be a lot more adamant on not wasting fuel for nothing, and might speak up more often about trying to stay as efficient as possible. 
Maybe I'm just not used to how the Star Wars universe handles these gigantic distances between planets, fuel for the ship, and hyperspace travel, who knows, but that's the main way in which the game did a poor job of hiding the flaw in logistics when hopping from planet to planet willy-nilly. It would be super cool to have to worry about how you'll manage your fuel to get to the places you need to be, maybe going out of your way to do a side thing to obtain more or credits to buy some, but it really wouldn't make much sense in a game as streamlined as this. I'll just keep my hopes up for Star Wars Outlaws. Speaking of flying through space and landing on specific planets, you could also raise the argument that landing at the same exact spot on each planet every time is another bizarre immersion-breaking tidbit, but in all honesty, they did a great job of explaining why these specific areas are where we need to be. That spot in Morgano is where Seer knew her master was keeping BD-1 and the vault. Zeppo had a storm brewing and Cal pointed it out, saying Cordova mentioned the Eye of the Storm, so we go there. Kashyyyk has a giant look over here tree, which is likely what Cordova was talking about with the striations and all that, but even more, we choose to help out the fighters nearby, which leads us to the people who might know where Tarful is. Dathomir isn't as clear, but our landing spot is right outside a Sith tomb, so maybe it was explained and I just didn't catch it. Ilum is obvious, and the final area, Seer knows roughly where it is as well, so yeah, this was handled better than expected. It's really nice when there's a bit of effort to explain some things away. It's a breath of fresh air coming from a few other games I played recently. The fact that this is a Metroid-style game makes it all the more impressive, since that genre tends to be very gamey by nature. I've mentioned Metroid a few times now, and where those influences feel the strongest is with the exploration elements. The holographic 3D map feels pulled straight from Metroid Prime. You of course acquire new abilities, be it droid or forest related, that open up areas you couldn't access before, and BD-1 can even scan things for you, letting you keep a log of enemies and creatures alike, along with backstory info on the Empire and Zepho and much more. I can't say I particularly enjoy using the Hollow Map. The color scheme kind of makes it hard to understand without zooming in and seriously analyzing entrances to rooms one by one. The pathways being so obviously color-coded is another quality of life feature, and given that this is in 3D with hyper-detailed graphics, I can't say I'm too bothered by it. Sure, a little straightforward, yellow being unexplored, red being off-limits with your current gear, green being accessible with your current gear. It's alright. I'd prefer rooms and blocked pathways being more memorable and eye-catching, but with everything having to stick closely to the Star Wars setting, I'm sure it isn't as easy to throw in a lava room or something to make a player remember a location for later. I could complain about how the focus on graphics makes the level design harder to read at a glance, which furthers the need for the designers to add silly things like red floodlights on top of wall-runnable walls or what have you to make sure a player will notice them, but I'm just not interested in bitching about all of that. I know what kind of game this is, who cares, let's move on. Similarly, I'm not going to hammer on and on about the load times being out of control. Thankfully, the performance mode on my PS5 version of the game, which prioritized frame rate over visuals, made the load times a bit less drastic, but Good lord, staring at a black loading screen for 30 to 50 seconds after a death is a great way to get a player to drop the game entirely, or lower the difficulty as much as possible so they rarely had to see it. If the performance mode wasn't an option, I would have likely stuck to the normal difficulty, opposed to Jedi Master and Grand Master after a while. The fact that you can change it at a moment's notice is nice, but it is ripe for abuse, especially if you're running back to the place you just died and want to skip by the in-between fauna filler. That said, that's the one way in which the map of Fallen Order completely falls short. Why on earth don't designers put an X on the map where you most recently died? Considering some of your XP is locked to the enemy that killed you, yeah, it's kind of important to know where that stupid animal was, or where that fucking ridiculous unclimbable ledge was placed. This issue can be compounded, as if you didn't abuse the difficulty change and are very, very far from your last meditation point you actually rested at. Oh man, can it be tedious to figure out where you were. Do you stick to your guns and keep the difficulty where it is, or lower it and tell the game to go scomp itself? Speaking of the Souls mechanic of experience being lost on death, the way Fallen Order handles it is very strange. The idea of it replenishing health and force, in a way, incentivizes a more cavalier approach to getting back to where you were. Why worry about reaching that area unscathed if you'll be rewarded with a full heal regardless? If anything, it's almost the counter-ideology of those early Souls games. There, dying was punished harshly and made the next life that much harder, either by taking your human form from you, halving your health and pushing the world tendency to black and demon souls even, and lowering your max HP in Dark Souls 2. Here, though, a player is given a warm blanket and some hot cocoa to soothe their hurt butt. 
All of that makes it extra peculiar, however, that the enemies that killed you take on a pale glow, which covers their red visual cue for non-blockable attacks. I realize it's very simple to hit them once and make them look normal again, but it absolutely has happened where an enemy did a non-guardable attack, and I could barely register it since I was accustomed to the red highlight. I really don't get why this is the case, but it has to be intentional, right? This feels like a deliberate decision opposed to a silly oversight. The flaws are far too obvious to go unnoticed. The staggered unlocking of force powers and other abilities is fine, but the early game feels a bit barren. The pathetic looking skill tree and your starting arsenal being particularly unexciting. I've probably played through Braca and the first Bogana visit close to four times thanks to me trying to like the game over and over, and I'm happy I pushed through this time as it gets much better as it goes on. I can't believe others feel opposite on that front. Bogana is so ungodly boring, and Zepho with only wall run at your disposal is almost as bad. For the first time in forever, I found the forest level to be the best of them all. The Shadowlands of Kashyyyk are absolutely great. Not only do you already have force push and pull at this point, and plenty of other moves to play around with, the environments themselves are so much fun. Underwater, crazy danger flora, bouncy boys. It's a shame how long it takes for the game to really open up and get exciting, but I'd say from Zepho's second visit and onwards, it's consistently good. Although I think it takes too many in-game hours to get to in absolute terms, I don't hate the order in which the force powers are doled out. Well, I mean the slow ability being with you at the start is kinda shitty, that's the least interesting force power by a mile, but moving past that, push being unlocked relatively early on is smart, as it gives the player some time to have fun with it and experiment. The pull is fine where it is I guess, but what I was most impressed by was the double jump. I didn't even know there would be a double jump, I figured that gap on Dathomir would require a super fast speed boost or something. BD1 even corrects Cal, saying that it's not that he can't jump high, he can't jump far, so I really wasn't predicting an extra mid-air leap. The gaps on Bogana feel similar, it's a long distance, not a high ledge. It says something when a Metroid style game can make the ubiquitous double jump, something expected as the very first thing you discover in these games, or close to it anyway, to be one of the last things you acquire, even after getting the ability to dive underwater. Kudos to Respawn, good on you. Diving underwater was a fun surprise too, I absolutely adore underwater exploration and any game not named Subnautica. Yeah, go figure. I have to say though, the chests you find in these flooded sections are a bit ridiculous. Not that they're there in the first place, but the animation that plays out when you open them. BD1 stays on your back, the chest rumbles around like he's in there, and Cal asks BD1 what he found while underwater. It is funny, but in a low budget, something is wrong with the game way, which I'm not sure Respawn were going for. The humor of the game was one of the highlights, and I don't just mean some of the dialogue and scripted scenes that made me laugh. The gameplay itself, along with some voice lines here and there, foster a sort of emergent comedy gameplay, almost akin to what the older Elder Scrolls titles had. Not that it's as ridiculous as those games, or nearly as buggy, I just mean the ingredients for a funny situation are all present, and when certain elements collide with each other at the right time, a serendipitous bit of hilarity can ensue. Having force powers in a game with these types of physics can already lead to some lighthearted fun for the whole family, but mixed with the crazy power imbalance between a Jedi and Stormtrooper, and the fact that the troopers were all given lines that either acknowledge the power imbalance and cower because of it, or deny it and rise up to the challenge turned so many would-be thoughtless enemy clearings into enjoyable and hilarious moments in time. He can't match us. You can't beat us all. Smash him. Oh no, oh no, no, no. I knew he would run. Absolutely incredible. These didn't feel forced in any way for me, even though I know the developers were likely hoping stuff like this happened. I mean, they gave the troopers these voice lines. Talk all you want. I only need a few hits. Surely they would have expected the player to toy with them. But that's what makes it great, the fact that you don't need to kill them at all if you really don't want to, you can defeat all of them without even thinking, or some of the better lines might not even trigger in time for a funny moment to happen. It's the seeming randomness of it all which takes it up a notch. Here's the Jedi! Not liking this. Okay, I'm done! You don't scare me. Just fantastic. 
The visuals are great on the whole, but that should be obvious. Who cares about discussing the visibly high-budget game's graphics? That said, the times where the camera pulls back on its own to let you see a gorgeous vista or other grand background thing were more than welcome. I mentioned in my Resident Evil video, which is good by the way and you should watch it, that I'd actually prefer seeing developers play with their camera angles a bit more, and this is what I'm talking about. These always occur when the pace is on the slower side, and I very much appreciated the visuals and perspective they offered. You could easily argue that without them, the relatively unexciting gameplay wouldn't need to exist in the first place, and sure, but I think that's always subjective. For me, these worked. I loved them, and this is coming from the guy who both looks forward to and dreads playing The Last of Us, since while I love the combat, the slow walking segments with nothing going on are near agony. This brings me to the big majestic bird in Kashyyyk. I liked saving him, I liked riding him. I don't know what other games this moment is in, but I guess I haven't played them. In all seriousness, while I do think this is a fun scene on its own, and shows that Cal's default setting is to help, which says something about his character for reasons relating to the story section which I'll put on screen real quick, there's one thing missing. Cal uses a healing stim on the bird, but there's no consequence to this action. Your sim count is the same after the sequence as it was before it. At the very least, it could have dwindled your current healing stim count by one, since you'll get it back by meditating anyway, but Man, if aiding this bird meant you had to give up one of your only healing items permanently, this moment would have been all the better for it. Cal would have had to make a sacrifice to be of help, to push forward with his mission. In the air, Cal mentions how there's so much the Empire hasn't touched, which goes along with the theme I talked about earlier, how it's inspiring that there's still so much that the Empire hasn't gotten their grubby hands on and ruined. I think this brings him a bit of clarity. There's always something to keep fighting for, a reason to keep pushing, but it would have hit home more if he first had to give up something to see this sight, to have this thought. That's all I have about the bird segment, but it's good. I'm glad it's in the game. The last thing I'll mention about the gameplay in isolation relates to the secrets you'll uncover. The cosmetic doodads you find in chests feel a bit tacked on when viewing them from one perspective, since every modern game needs tickbox collectibles to hunt for. But I mean, secrets and extra outfits were a thing in many older games, so if anything, I'm just happy this stuff is unlocked in-game opposed to it being DLC or some garbage. Not that I really cared for it. All the ponchos look goofy and behave chaotically in the wind. Who cares what your ship looks like? BD1's best design is obviously the default one they sell toys with, and the lightsaber is rarely ever zoomed in on besides when you're using a workbench to modify it. Along with the stuff you find in chests, there's also some type of premium content, which I always went out of my way to avoid, even if that meant not picking the sick orange color for the lightsaber blade. <sighs> it is cool, but something about seeing that premium content label slapped next to it made me feel gross. I mean, I still used it, but that was for you guys. I wanted to give the viewers some visual variety in saber color and design. You're welcome. I'll take my flowers now. Initially, I was going to complain about how Cal would always act surprised whenever BD-1 would jump into a crate to collect its contents, but once I got further into the game, I realized Cal was changing his reactions. Hey! Come back here. Just what we need. Wanna check it out? I knew you'd jump in there. Yep, there you go. Just need to know, don't you? I think that's a really nice touch, and the many, many voice lines available for Cal to say when he opens a chest helps these mostly unsatisfying discoveries feel a bit more enjoyable. It's not only nice to see that Cal is a person who can grow and understand the world around him, even if it's as simple as the tendency for his pal to dive into containers when he opens them, but it also acts as a reflection of how far along Cal and BD1's friendship is as a whole. These little interactions really helped sell me on this relationship. What started out as a kind of forced droid sidekick, one seemingly only existing to be a gamey solution to some problems and a vehicle for jokes, became something a bit more real. Even before I truly confirmed my emotional attachment with him in Ilum, the foundation was already set in place, and his reliable and good-hearted nature, coupled with the frequent interactions with him, even some as basic as Cal thanking him for getting another poncho skin or finding a new object to scan, unknowingly made it easy to see him as a real friend. BD1's there to listen and encourage when Cal needs to vocalize his thoughts, and also there to save Cal from potential death. The only thing I would change, personally, is letting the player open a few chests alone at first, making an animation that'll solely get used for the first one or two crates, where Cal would reach in, you know, with his hands. 
It would have made Cal's surprise much more believable for when BD-1 hops into the containers when he supposedly isn't expecting it. Like, dude, you've never so much as reached your hand into one of these. Why are you acting shocked exactly? Although I was at first very not into the characters and dialogue they spat out, something changed once I finally broke through from those opening hours. Now that I like the game, one of the moments that made me roll my eyes initially is retroactively a bit better. Okay, shut that thing off and grab some seat. Breeze's lines are still on the unfunny side for me, which made him pretty unlikable, but he did come around near the end, and his persistent pepper shaking when Seer and Cal were arguing over the dinner table literally made me laugh out loud. Cal and I was captured by the Empire. And I know there's nothing I can do to make that right. But Cal, there's still a chance we can save the others on the holocron. Okay, look. The funniest line, for me, had to have been during the AT-AT sequence. First of all, gotta admit, I loved this section. I thought I wouldn't like it, that it would feel lame and forced and gimmicky, and it kinda is all those things, but it's also awesome, too. You fly into Kashyyyk for the first time and see the Empire closing in on a guerrilla fighter ship of some kind, so Cal, being the babyface he is, wants to help. You dive down into the water, swim up to a moss-covered AT-AT, climb the fucking thing, slither into its insides, taking out some unsuspecting troopers, comically clank the pilot's head together, and then this. Okay, uh, throttle. Report, what's happening over there? You're in violation of Imperial Protocol Shut that guy up. 207. Stand down or we won't have... I have no shame in admitting that I burst out laughing at that line. Plus, the gameplay in the driver's seat is fun for what it is, and Cal even says at-at afterwards. How could it get any better? Someone who just brought an at-at to the table. Cal as a character, one that I was hesitant to like on the outset, won me over considerably by the halfway point, and near the end, I couldn't believe how in his corner I was. He's one of the reasons this game feels like a traditional Star Wars story, one that I'm perfectly content with existing. He has this naive, almost Luke-like energy to him. He wants to do what's right, will stick by his friends, go out of his way to help as many people as he can, and won't back down from a difficult situation. That said, he's also reckless, doesn't understand how much his actions can affect those around him, is innocent to a fault, and isn't ready to face some harsh truths in life. I can kind of understand him wanting to trust Trilla. She makes some good points, fills him in on events he had little knowledge of, and shines a spotlight on Seer and her actions as a whole. It is kind of nuts that Seer found him out of nowhere and rescued him, that this weird Grease dude is who she has to put up with, even though his gambling debts and bad habits will, and have already, started to catch up to them. I'd be suspicious of her, yes, but I can also understand him pushing that distrust down once he found Eno Cordova's holograms and BD-1 on Bogana. Eno Cordova is so charismatic and likable, I don't blame Cal for blindly wanting to follow wherever Eno's research took him. I particularly love how many of Cordova's logs begin with, My friend. My friend. My friend. As if he was really there with us, telling all about his travels and discoveries. It really endeared me to him. I found myself wishing Cal could have met Cordova, that I could have met him. He's a somewhat tragic figure. He saw the fall of the Jedi in a vision, and did try to warn them, but nobody would listen. The only one who gave him any mind was his old confidant, who had access to the archives, coincidentally enough, and she was able to give him a holocron copy of all the four sensitive children in the galaxy, so someone else one day could unravel his findings and prevent the Jedi from going extinct. Just seems like a good dude, and his whole vibe just strikes me as a wholesome dad who would be a killer barbecue host. Anyway, Cal's willingness to trust Eno and Seer to go along with this operation despite his initial hesitancy is fine, as is him giving a bit of credence to what Trilla had to say about her former master. Yeah, Seer did keep information from him when she probably shouldn't have, lied about some of the particulars, and Trilla's argument about how Cal can't trust Seer with the holocron of younglings, given that she's already demonstrated she'll give up her own Padawan and abuse the dark side, is fairly convincing. Trilla is very good at being manipulative, something Cal said at the start of this scene that he wouldn't fall victim to, but he still does. His rush to accept what Trilla, a red-colored lightsaber user, says about Seer shows that he has a lot of learning and growing up to do. Again, like I've said, I can understand wanting to hear her out, but she's just tried to kill him, is part of the Empire, and is trying to attain what Cal is searching for before he does. I'm all for not being so black and white, but in this universe, with the Jedi and Sith, especially around the time of Order 66, it's very, very black and white, and that's from my outside perspective. 
From a Jedi's perspective, it's even more drastic. The dark side is something never to be tampered with, not even for escaping a torture prison, I guess. Him even considering Trilla's words demonstrates how young and naive Cal still is. In his defense, he wasn't able to contact Seer for a very long time. He had to push on with only Trilla in his ear for a while on Zepho, all the way until he got captured by a bounty hunter, had to escape from a prison, fight in a gladiatorial arena, and then he gets to see Seer. He powered through all of that, but even more, he made sure to inform them of the mission-critical information first that the Empire knows about the Holocron, and then he talks about Trilla. That level of patience is commendable. It shows he has some level of dedication and self-control, that his priorities are in line. However, his way of broaching the topic is a bit childish and demeaning, and he's all too eager to put aside this conversation for later while he returns to the mission on Kashyyyk. Maybe you could view this as him being mature, not letting his interpersonal conflict interfere with his work, but to me, it looks a bit different. It reminds me of those husband and wife dynamics in old sitcoms or bad marriages, where the husband wants to avoid an argument so he glues himself to his work. Any excuse to not have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Seer also seems to want to move on, and I'll get to her later, trust me, but still, Cal's attitude gives off an air of unaccountability, which speaks to his somewhat arrogant and reckless current self. It's fine, he can handle himself, let's jump off the ship with no plan in place. All of this makes sense, people are flawed, and especially in the first three quarters of the game, Cal shows that while he is a good person, he's young, inexperienced, and unwise. If Cal does something as hasty as this in Jedi Survivor, I'll be pretty disappointed to say the least. Grease, while initially acting only as comedy relief, proves to be vital in helping Cal along in his emotional journey. After deciding to save the Trilla conversation for later with Seer, even though they have enough time to sleep on the ship even, Grease pays him a visit. This is where the seed gets planted, and it's a well-done moment. Cal tries to brush him off and act like a child, but Grease stops him in his tracks. I think it's my business. And we're all in this together, aren't we? He then does something I doubt Cal was expecting. He admits he made a mistake and apologizes for it. I'm not really interested in examining how his gambling debts turned into Cal being captured, so look past that. He then says, I mean, We all make mistakes, right? <laughs> well, maybe not you. Which, at first blush, could be viewed as a surface level, Grease thinks Jedi are some infallible force, that Cal is a goody two-shoes who never does anything wrong, but it hits home on a different layer. Cal is still unwilling to acknowledge and face his past. Without realizing it, Grease showed what accountability looks like, even if it's a very mild, but still genuine version of it. Like I said though, this is a seed, and much like the ones you collect for Grease's terrarium, it takes a while to grow and bloom. After returning from Kashyyyk and defeating the Ninth Sister, Cal isn't ready to even give Seer the time to explain herself. He still pulls away, non-verbally communicating how done with this conversation he is, or that he's not interested in talking about it. Another helpful conversation with Grease, one that is entirely optional, happened with me on a return Bogana visit. It is cool that this is here for curious players who want to get the most out of the dialogue and characters, but the wording of this message feels too important to leave to chance. Grease says it isn't always about team spirit, there are parts of our past that we don't want to face, let alone share. It's a good answer as to why Seer didn't voluntarily open up about her past, at least not fully anyway, and given enough time, Cal will likely realize her actions are mirroring his. At the beginning of Dathomir, after they land, Seer tries once more to talk with him. She doesn't even try to explain herself again, just give cautionary advice and warn Cal of the dangers ahead. Cal cuts her off repeatedly, saying he isn't Trilla, he won't turn, he's done this before. Very juvenile and condescending, but just like Luke had to, Cal has to evolve past this naive and immature version of himself. He has to face what's really weighing him down, and Dathomir gives him the perfect place to do just that. What better way to address your insecurities and PTSD head-on than lowering your mental defenses on the doorstep to a Sith tomb? Throughout the game, Cal has had visions, some from his past to help him remember his training, but others as a warning of the dangers to come. While it might not have made a great first impression on me, looking back, and playing it through again, the train ride with Prof, his scrapper buddy on Bracca, was a very well-executed bit of foreshadowing. Cal has been in hiding on Bracca most of his life, dismantling starships and trying to blend in as much as possible. It's a shame we don't get to revisit this world. It's pretty neat looking, even if it's only ever talked about as a junk planet, and the scale of these gigantic star destroyers is humbling. 
It visually compares Cal to the Empire as a whole. He's practically nothing compared to the scale of the galaxy-domineering dictatorship. Cal choosing to save his friend from a freak accident with the Force on instinct, even though he knows it'll put him in danger, is a great showing of who he is as a person. From the very start, he's selfless to a fault. The vision he has of his master in the train car that becomes an endless cruiser hallway is great, and it accomplishes a few things at once, even if some of them only become obvious in retrospect. Most would likely guess this foreshadows the next scene, and his former master warning Cal to only trust in the Force is likely a general warning of things to come. This could be seen as Jaro cautioning Cal about trusting Prof, but I don't really see it that way. It reads more of a trust your instincts and be aware type of deal. Looking back though, it's easy to spot that this interior was the same one his PTSD stems from, where he and his master were hunted down during Order 66. Even more, I'd imagine Cal, for the past few years, has tried his best not to think of his master, to push all that down, as he blames himself for Jaro to Paul's death. Sure, Jaro is imposing when he opens the door, but it's clear Cal is petrified when lying eyes on him. He has a lot of trauma when it comes to his Padawan days, which is likely why he has to relearn what he was taught in the past, since he's spent so long wallowing in his own self-pity, trying to forget. The way they word it is, Cal's connection to the Force was damaged, and I think that's a truly terrible line, probably the worst in the entire game. Even a slight rewording would have made it sound far more natural, but the main takeaway for me is, Cal is afraid to take the plunge. He's either consciously or subconsciously blocking away the trauma. The second notable vision is more of a flashback, but it's wrapped up in the Force making him face inward. This is the second moment of the three or four I referenced at the start. This single-handedly made me rethink my complaint of the time period decision, and it's not even especially original or anything. I just realized as it was happening that, oh, of course, Order 66 is the perfect usage of dramatic irony in all of Star Wars, maybe even popular media as a whole. It's an event so infamous, so important, that it shapes the course of the galaxy within a single sentence. I remember the final season of Clone Wars being excellent in the lead up to Order 66, and this gave me a similar sensation, except even better since I was playing it. I was seeing it unfold and trying to escape it. We're not there yet, though. When you decide to meditate after not being able to open the tomb, you wake up in the cruiser as a child. You're about to see Jaro for a final test, and on the way, you can talk to clones. This is when the realization started to hit me. These clones might be the very ones that'll try to kill me soon. One says he and Cal should have a rematch, implying they have a friendly rivalry in some game or something. Two talk about leaving this planet, and yep, we're currently over Bracca, the planet we know Cal ends up stranded on. One of the clones even says he'll talk to Cal later. We know that's not happening, though. Finally, the worst of all, the last clone trooper gives words of encouragement and even high-fives Cal. Brutal. Your final test is to get to your master, using the abilities you've learned from previous flashbacks in this room. These basic platforming challenges took on a sense of dread, since I knew something big was about to happen, just not when, and Respawn capitalized on this feeling by having one of the clones start firing at you as you're still going. I'm pretty sure I shrieked in surprise when this happened. They very much fooled me into thinking that this was how it all started. It was a distraction built into the test, though. Very clever, developers. Then, it happens. Are you okay? No! No! What follows is Cal doing his best to stay calm and follow his master's guidance, that being to run so they can both escape. At one point, he drops his lightsaber. Jaro doesn't hide his disappointment. Had him on your lightsaber! Sorry, master! We get a small glimpse of Jaro decimating some clones, and they head for the doors. Jaro holds them back as long as he can, but falls victim to the laser fire. Cal slows the clones down before they duck into the escape pod. Jaro says to trust in the Force, gives Cal his lightsaber, and Cal is left on his own. When waking up, we're back on Dathomir, but we're in a dream ethereal space. Cal has to attack this embodiment of his insecurities and regrets, which takes on the form of a disapproving master. He ends up stabbing Jaro, all while his master hurls insults and cheap shots at him. When he comes to, the grip from his master that was crushing his lightsaber came from him alone, and now he's left without a weapon. I think all of this was a really good idea, the many force visions he experiences. It employs one of the more interesting visual storytelling devices seen in other Star Wars media, while managing not to be a complete bore in the process. 
It may seem on the nose, but I mean, it's Star Wars, what do you expect? This journey Cal is on feels earned. It feels like there's a genuine arc to it. He's a character who goes through hardship, isn't perfect, learns and faces his fears, or in Star Wars lingo, faces the dark side. One side note I'll throw in here real quick. The scene in the Order 66 flashback of Cal dropping his lightsaber mirrors the moment earlier where we learned Force Pull. They hang on this slowed down scene for a very long time, I'd say too long, and Cal doesn't really seem affected by it afterwards. I think the slow-mo effect should have been half its length. Cal should have shouted in desperation as it was falling, maybe something like, no, 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 not again, and maybe afterwards touched on it being a close call or something. I don't know, it's clearly a callback, or a foreshadow, I guess, so I don't know why they didn't really do much with it. Anyway, when you leave the Sith tomb, there's a cutscene involving two characters I haven't mentioned, but I don't want to get into all that yet. Cal and Seer finally have a great conversation about living with past mistakes, about moving on and keeping hope alive. Shout out to Respawn, by the way, for not using the word hope a hundred times. I think I'm using it more than the characters in this story. Cal's next objective is to rebuild his own lightsaber, the kyber crystal of which only being found on Ilum. Well, they say it's one of few places in the galaxy, but you get it. Getting to travel here yourself and take the path the younglings supposedly have to take when first learning the ways of the Jedi is super cool and was very much unexpected for me. I do think it's a bit bullshit that Jedi claim ownership of this planet and this resource for their religious indoctrination pilgrimages. Absolutely fuck them, but whatever. The crystal being seen from afar is great, but what's even better is the end result of this adventure. Cal falls into freezing water, almost drowns, but his Padawan self pulls him out of the water. Maybe this is a way of showing us he's ready to truly embrace and forgive that kid who was still learning and trying his best back on the cruiser orbiting Bracca. Even still, afterwards he can barely drag himself towards the crystal, and when he finally gets there, it breaks and he loses all hope. I do wish he fell down and stumbled a bit more, and that we controlled him as he slowly gimped his way over so we could feel the struggle, but it's fine. This setup was all the next bit needed, the third of the three or four great moments in the game. BD-1 comes in and projects a message from Cordova, one we haven't seen before. It's revealed that BD-1's memories were encrypted, temporarily erased essentially, until he found someone he could trust, who was as brave and persistent as him. BD-1 chose to give up his memories to help Cordova, to help the future rebellion, the Jedi, fight against the incoming Empire. It was his job to find someone trustworthy to replace Cordova and help them unravel Cordova's web of discoveries and secrets to finally find the Holocron. This moment worked wonders on me, and the shift from viewing this droid as a mechanical gimmick helper into a reliable companion and trusted friend was happening without any significant cutscenes to show for it. The gradual change in how Cal talked with BD-1, even with something as simple as opening crates, did its job. The consistent banter between Cal and BD-1 when exploring, even though we could only understand half of the conversation, paid off. When he saved Cal's life from the second sister, that didn't go unnoticed. That was important to Cal, and he thanked him for it, acknowledging that without his help, he may have died. It all worked. I was endeared to him by the end, and this moment pushed it over the top. The fact that BD-1 presumably says, I believe in you, after the message was done playing, put a grin on my face, and I even exclaimed, Aww, while being fully aware I was alone in my upstairs bedroom, overly reacting to a piece of Star Wars media of all things. Fuck, I'm so lame. BD-1 convinces Cal that all isn't lost, and they try to make the lightsaber even with the broken crystal. Another awesome surprise, one that I, again, made loud noises when seeing, was picking what color of lightsaber I used from then on. Seriously, I'm pretty sure the noise was something akin to... <laughs> as I scrolled through the many options available. If someone out there really picked green or blue when they got to this point, what the fuck, man, come on. I picked yellow, as all the OGs know and respect Bastila's double-bladed yellow saber. This is also where you learn the dual saber attack, which is extremely powerful in boss fights, but we're not there yet. The next section is, in a way, very good, but in a way, really poor. There are two notable characters I haven't spoken a word of yet, Terran Malakos and Night Sister Marin. These are the only two people on Dathomir, and thus they aren't built up well. Thankfully, I came to Dathomir early and saw Night Sister Marin right away, who at the very least appeared to be antagonistic towards intruders. I also saw this robed wanderer guy who seemed rather odd and out of place. 
At the very least, this area and these two people had time to linger in my mind, but I can't imagine how rushed it must have felt if people came to Dathomir only when they had to. After the second Kashyyyk visit, smushing two of the three-thirds of the planet into one play session. Then again, maybe that would have been for the better, as my brain was on the hunt for twists and reveals while those two sat in my memory. Along with thinking Seer might betray Cal later on, I also suspected this robed man might be Eno Cordova himself. Cordova was eccentric and known to be a loner, so I thought, well, maybe this is where he ended up and went mad. He even says he's studying dead philosophies and extinct cultures. Sadly, no, it's just some random guy whose backstory we hear kinda all at once. He was a Jedi, Order 66 happened, he escaped it, crash landed on this planet, tricked its inhabitants to give him power, and convinced Marin that the Jedi were the ones that killed her sisters. For some reason. He wanted to learn the Night Sisters' magic, so he lied to her, leading her to believe the Jedi killed her sisters, and that he would then help her get revenge on the Jedi? What? Bruh, did Terra not know about Grievous or Count Dooku, or what? Why blame the Jedi and not the Sith? Terran as a whole is just so out of nowhere and half-baked. A fallen Jedi Master turned to the dark side thanks to the dark energy of a Sith homeworld is a neat idea, but quite literally, you come across him without the double jump, he has a brief chat, he then stands there forever until you come back. You fall down a water slide, have some fun getting back to the surface with some climbing claws, and you don't see him there when you return. He reappears outside the tomb after the Order 66 vision and Cal Saber is destroyed, then takes off his cloak as if it's some big reveal, and explains who he is. A random guy, got it. Marin shows up, asks why he's wanting Cal to join their forces if the Jedi supposedly killed her sisters, and uses this as a final wake-up call to ditch Terran, who she presumably never liked anyway. She raises the dead, and you run away to Ilum. Sure, the Force Echoes are a fun bit of lore to discover, which hints at some of this stuff, but it's very brief and doesn't fix the core problems of all of this. It almost feels like Terran was slapped here for their first visit at the last minute, like they decided, oh shit, players can come to this planet really early on? Uh, hurry, make him say some vague bullshit and leave him standing there, sure. There's barely any screen time with him, and unlike the second sister, these two Dathomir characters aren't at all on our characters' minds. They can't be, naturally, since you only need to come here close to the end of the game. A player might not see these two until that point, so you can't exactly have Cal wondering about his future with Marin, or talk about who that crusty old guy was with BD-1 while platforming. Anyway, when you return after Ilum, Cal is finally ready to tackle that test once more, facing his master and his past with a new lightsaber in tow. Make note that Jaro mentions that simply having a lightsaber isn't what makes a Jedi. After a small nothing fight, Cal sheathes his saber and shows how far he's come. He acknowledges he won't ever forget what happened, that he'll live with the memories and honor his master's teachings. Cal's manifestation of Jaro to Paul seems satisfied with this new development, which means Cal's inner psyche is content with it too. Cal seems so much calmer, almost like Neo in the Matrix at the end. He's, at the very least, taken on the outward demeanor of a Jedi. This bleeds over into his interaction with Marin. He puts away his blade, even tosses it over to her, repeating the words he had just heard from his master. This is especially great to contrast how they first- What? Jedi are thieves and selfish liars who bring nothing but death! Back off! If you attack me again, I'll strike you down. Marin, right? I'm Cal Kestis. What you were told about the Jedi was not true. All I do know is having a lightsaber isn't what makes you a Jedi. Great stuff. Marin reveals her backstory, and we move on. As much as his build-up wasn't very good, the dialogue between Terran Malakos and Cal had me pretty engaged. Cal says he doesn't want power, but to restore the Jedi Order. Terran makes some good points, some I've even thought to myself about the Jedi ways. Stilted by tradition, deafened by past glories, blinded by endless war. At this point, I remember saying out loud, he's got a point sting. But Cal counters by saying something that also makes sense, and aligns with the lessons he's learned in his journey. Past mistakes don't mean you need to tear it all down, you can learn, rebuild. At this point, I remember saying out loud, oh shit, he's got a point too. Terran, what you got? And then... Terran kinda shits the bed, going on about Jedi being bad and wanting to start something new without any decent points being made. Sorry Terran, Cal's got my vote. Terran then decides to murder Cal for not wanting to be his apprentice. Oh, alright then. 
This boss fight is really fun. I enjoyed it quite a lot. It's a battle that feels like some of the better Souls and Sekiro encounters. He's aggressive, has a lot of attacks to learn, and uses the force now and then to throw stuff at you, which you can even force push back at him. At one point, it looks like Cal is about to die in a cutscene without your control, and Marin makes the save. Some could view this as cheap. Cal would have lost his life if not for this random chick deciding to help him. How stupid. Except, it's not random. This is the direct result of Cal talking with Marin earlier, lowering his defenses by giving up his lightsaber, showing her that Jedi aren't the enemy. Sure, it's out of the player's hands, but this is very much the result of a decision from Cal, him being a mature adult and using his words, treating Marin like a person with respect. I was all about it. This little duo tandem ass-kicking was neat. There's just one problem, though. Bugs. I feel like I had him first try, until a button mashing sequence started up, then he glitched away, but the prompt was still there. I didn't know what to do, I took damage since I was so surprised, then it jerked me back into the button mashing sequence once more, failed me immediately, I took damage, both physical and psychic, and subsequently died. Just a real shame, and while I haven't talked about bugs much as of yet, I will later on in a more rapid-fire manner. I only bring this one up now since it totally killed the vibe and momentum I had. Anyway, after the fight, Marin locks Terran in the tomb with her powers, and in a wild turn of events, Cal and Marin bond over their isolated and lonely childhood and... Shit, she wants to come with? Awesome. Awesome to the max. Now that we have the key, we can return to the vault on Bogana. Something that I have mixed feeling towards is how Marin raises a lot of good points about the faults in this plan to get the Holocron to rebuild the Jedi Order. She makes Cal defend this decision repeatedly, asking if it's smart to take these children from their homeworlds, if it'll make their lives better, if we have the right to do that, and even more, if this'll lead to their suffering. Will they be hunted down like Cal and the rest of the Jedi are? Why would we want that for them? On one hand, excellent point, Marin. But on the other... Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention YESTERDAY! Like, we're so far into this game, into this plan, we've come so far, and only now we get the philosophical and moral questions about it all? The last really good vision relates to this, when Cal finally uses the MacGuffin Astrium to open the MacGuffin Vault so he can finally get the MacGuffin Holocron, he sees the potential future of the four sensitive kids. He trains them, he watches them run away from the Empire, hunted down by Storm and Purge troopers, murdered, captured, held prisoner, tortured. Finally, Cal sees himself as an Inquisitor, falling to the torture, to the dark side, much like Trilla did, like all the Inquisitors did. We awake, there's another miniature fight with Trilla, then she pulls a prank on Cal, he grabs her lightsaber, and he falls to his knees and Trilla escapes with the holocron. What a sick prank! Good on you, Trilla! Wow! In all seriousness, this is very silly, and although Cal having the ability to sense echoes of the past is explained early on, it's a pretty sudden and ham-fisted way of having Cal and the viewers see Trilla's past experiences. The Empire has now invaded Bogana, and this once happy and celebratory slide down the mud slope from the beginning of the game now takes on an entirely different feeling. That said, so does the Agdo Bagdo thing that pops up. Before he was a nuisance, and now he shows up to distract the stormtroopers. Very well executed reversal, in my opinion. Before moving on to Null and the final act of the game, I think it's time we talked about Seer. She thankfully isn't as underdeveloped as Marin or Terran, but she even has a lot more going on than Grease. She's been fighting her own battles, her inner struggle relates to the pull of the dark side. She's made past mistakes too, as we saw glimpses of just recently, and have been hearing about from Seer and Trilla throughout the game. She gave up the location of her Padawan after cracking under the pressure of the Empire's torture. Hey, remember when people sometimes defend the Empire unironically? Anyway, yeah, she was tortured, gave up Trilla, Trilla then cracked and became an Inquisitor, and upon seeing that, Seer gave in to the dark side, using it to escape from torture prison. That's why she cut herself off from the Force, because of tampering with the dark side. She says it's a battle that never ends, but that's the test, and you have to keep fighting. So, I'll be honest, I don't like Seer. As a character, I do. She's complicated, the actor who plays her nailed the role beyond belief, her facial expressions knock it out of the park. I just don't like her as a person. Cal's past trauma relates to him feeling like he was the cause of his master's death. It was Order 66, a damn good reason to have such strong PTSD, to wallow in your own thoughts forever. 
However, with Seer, I get the impression she's more upset that she snapped and used the dark side more than she is about letting her Padawan down. I don't blame her for giving Trilla up, by the way. Who on earth could say they could stomach literal torture without coughing up anything and everything the people conducting the torture want to know? But in all of her conversations, it just seems like she's far more concerned about keeping the dark side at bay than anything else. Sure, maybe that is a more productive use of her time. Being sad about Trilla won't do anything, but I don't know. If you couldn't tell by now, I just don't buy the idea that the dark side is this untouchable side of the force, that nobody with good intentions can use it without turning objectively evil. Yes, it thrives on anger, passion, jealousy, hate, and other strong emotions, which sounds spooky on the surface, but from an outside perspective, one who isn't indoctrinated into this religious cult of Jedi or Sith, it looks like a worthless upholding of tradition. Uh, my religion is the right one, our way of doing things is the moral way, other religions are going to hell. Do Jedi also freak out when their Padawans play Dungeons and Dragons or listen to death metal music? They might get tattoos, ooh, scary! I don't know, the Jedi and their think of the children mindset, even though they steal children from their homes. Get over yourself, guys. Get over yourself, Seer. Now we have to travel to the place that molds Inquisitors, the planet where Trilla, Seer, and every other Jedi and Padawan were tortured. Before that, though, like, good fucking lord, don't stick that lightsaber so close to my fucking head! Seriously, if this is the knighting ceremony of the Jedi, it's absolutely stupid as shit. It's one thing to do this with a sword, but fucking hell, if Cal or Seer even so much as sneeze, there ends Cal's life. Plus, she did it with a red lightsaber, how is that not sacrilege of some kind? Yoda be rolling over in his grave, bruh. I mean, he ain't dead yet, but still. I don't really want to get into the ritual thing that Marin does to cloak the ship on the way to Nur, but I will highlight one specific funny bit that I liked. Grease and Seer still aren't fully convinced of having Marin on the ship, and once Marin offers to help, then jokes with Grease, Cal has this reaction, which nobody sees. Seer just walks away. Oh man, I love the grin on Cal's face, which slowly fades away when he sees her ignore him. Anyway, our pod thing lands in the water, Star Wars water is special and doesn't abide by the laws of physics, and we swim to the submerged torture facility. Definitely the final area in the game, lots of combat, lots of difficult enemies. Yeah, it's alright. There's a fun scene where Seer absolutely annihilates a group of purge troopers. Like, damn, she's better at this game than I am. Cal thanks BD1 for being his friend. Oh god, I nearly teared up, man! Wait, no, I remember now. The tears came during the final boss fight against Trilla a few moments later. This is the tentative fourth of the three or four great moments in the game. I have trouble fully praising this fight, as it does have its share of problems, and is by far the hardest fight in the game. Like, not even close. Nothing else compares to how difficult she is, and sadly, some of the reason she's so goddamn hard comes down to the issues with the fight. While it is true that the Ninth Sister subtly trained you to jump over her AoE attacks, Trilla's is absolutely terrible. Her lead-up to it is way too fast, there's barely ever a time to react to it, and she uses it when you're right next to her at times. I've seen others say it's because she's meant to dodge before triggering the attack, Thus, if she's too close to a ledge or wall, she can't clear the distance properly. I don't think that's what it is, or at the very least, I don't think that's the main problem. It needs more wind-up, it needs an extra second or two before it starts. Even worse, since many times I would jump immediately when I noticed it, which was too early, and my double jump wouldn't activate for some reason? She has a crap load of red unblockable attacks, but not even Sekiro bosses have this much variance in them. I swear, she has a good five or six different attacks that could trigger after a red glow and audio cue. The AoE water wave thing, a few stabs, a charge or two, two different grabs, I think, and a kick. It's madness, and considering only one of them requires jumping, figuring out which one is which within the span of a single second is asking too much, especially on higher difficulties. Just as a reminder, you can't jump while you're blocking, so make sure to release L1 before you press X. Or A. Whatever button, Jesus Christ. She also, for some reason, spawns a probe droid? What the fuck? Why was this needed? The lock-on targeting system makes it a gigantic chore, as you'll want to lock on to it, naturally. But not only does it like to stay on Trilla, if you're too far away, the lock-on just won't work. 
Unreal, right? The developers of this game were so blindly inspired by Dark Souls that they've kept a recurring issue from that series, where the lock-on system has a maximum distance even when you're in a boss room with no other enemies in it. Awful, awful stuff. Yet, goddamn I love this fight. Ignoring those problems, and I realize that's hard to do, this boss is awesome. If you fixed those issues, removed a handful of her unblockable attacks, shortened the length by 20%, this would be a picture-perfect encounter, one that I'd be more than happy to see more of, with other flavors of course, throughout another iteration of this game. Hopefully that's the case in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, that would be really awesome. I should mention that I purposely didn't acquire the upgrade that increases all lightsaber damage because, get this, I wanted to make sure the final boss fights were challenging enough. Well, I got my wish. The saving grace was the dual saber force attack, as that does a ridiculous amount of damage, it was fun planning around it, as because I had the upgrade where a healing stim replenished my force meter, I sometimes risked death by waiting a bit longer to heal, hoping to get another use of the dual saber attack in before using one of my only healing items. I wonder if anyone else had that dynamic going during this fight, it made it very unique. Imagine playing a spell build in a Dark Souls game, and drinking your Estus was how you got your mana back. That's kind of how it felt. The ending to this fight is worth all the pain and suffering, as the next bit is just immaculate. Seer and Trilla come face to face. Then, Darth Vader makes an appearance. Vader tosses Seer away, and Vader becomes the next boss! Until he stops you in your tracks, and you have to force pull a bit of machinery to save your life. Oh shit, Vader grabs it. Oh shit, Vader's throwing shit. Oh shit, we gotta run! This sequence of sprinting for your life while Vader isn't far behind is amazing. You momentarily escape him in an elevator, but he comes back 30 seconds later in a jump scare moment. BD-1 saves Cal's life, Cal gets a decent hit in, but Vader is a horror movie villain and turns Cal's lightsaber back on him. Seer makes the save and is about to fall to the dark side, embracing it in this moment, which Vader loves to see, but instead, with the help of Cal's encouragement, she turns to the light, using the force to protect, not to destroy. A very fitting end to her arc, it was very well done. I still think what I said about her earlier is true, but whatever. Also, Marin can swim apparently and saves us. Good thing she trained herself how to swim, I guess, when she was younger. So we did it! Our characters have the holocron, something Seer said herself was what brought her back from being suicidal, the thought of being able to build the Jedi Order and train these kids. And now, without talking it through with any of his crew, without so much as respecting their point of view, Cal takes it upon himself to make a choice, and destroys the holocron. Unfucking believable This ending is awful. This has been our entire goal the whole game. The whole game it's been about this, and only in the last hour has Marin been trying to raise points against it. The vision where Cal sees his Padawans get hunted and tortured is absolutely great, it is, and that's fine if it was meant to represent a turning point in Cal's mind. But you need, NEED him to talk about this vision with Seer. She needs to be a part of this decision. It more reads that he just now had the epiphany, and acted on it in a very rash manner. His reasoning is also stupid. I'm sure you've heard the joke where a devout Christian is caught in a flood or something, and prays to his god for help. A boat rides by, and the captain asks if he wants help, but the devout Christian declines, saying God will help him. A helicopter flies by, saying to get in, but the man declines, saying his god will help him. After he dies and gets to heaven, he asks why god didn't save him. He prayed like he should have. God replies, I sent a boat and a helicopter. What more do you want? Cal, what do you mean their destiny will be trusted to the Force? The Force brought you here and got you to escape Vader and retrieve the holocron. Sure, you could argue the Force vision warnings, plus the fact that in retrospect it became obvious that the Holocron would never have been in danger of falling to the Empire if not for Cal and Seer's actions, but still, this moment sucked, and Seer not getting any fucking lines in this last bit is insanely stupid. Let her at least agree, let her say something, god damn man. Where to next? Oh man, what a punch in the balls. Or vagina. Or butthole. Whatever body part you have that would suck to get punched in. That said, the story, the characters, this Star Wars adventure was good. I enjoyed it. More than just its cinematic elements, like all high-budget releases have, it felt like a movie, and I mean that in the best way possible. It had enough humor, enough seriousness, plenty of interesting Force-related shenanigans, and lots of character growth. 
That's not to say there weren't issues, but maybe it was simply due to my incredibly low expectations, I was surprised by how much I was into all of it. Even Vader didn't feel forced, it was a really fun surprise, and him being turned into a failure state horror chase was a great way to utilize him. Before closing the video out, there's one more thing I need to specifically touch on, otherwise I'd feel pretty fucking gross. Technical problems and or minor issues. Cal's eyeline isn't correct with BD-1s in a few shots, which is very noticeable. I don't know how a thing like this even happens if I'm honest, this is a video game, just lower Cal a few inches. Things kind of blink into place when a scene changes, and when gameplay transitions into a cutscene, it's sometimes not very smooth. Both of those things can take you out of the moment, which sucks, it almost makes things feel low budget. Similarly, when talking with your companions, their motions don't always look normal. Seer kept jerking her arms up and down here, for instance. Worse though, are the abrupt transitions between a cutscene in the ship, and the moments right afterwards when you gain control of Cal in the ship. That funny moment where Grease kept peppering his food while they ate at the table? Yeah, even though Grease was clearly still eating at the table, once Cal gets up, they teleport back to their defined spots like they were never there. On the first landing on Zepho, Seer says she'll have to work with the comms for a while to repair them, and she's visibly doing just that in her chair, but one second later, she's standing in a different spot, totally fine with having conversations with Cal. It's really bad. I've had it happen where there was a massive audio desync, like, I'm talking one to two whole seconds. Get us near those walkers. Wait, what? Listen, those walkers double as troop transport, so once you get inside... Not sure if this was a PS5 issue or not, but I closed out of the game afterwards and fixed it. There was one time where sound wasn't playing at all, and I had to do the same, reset the game. There's more. A couple times my lightsaber would say activated during cutscenes, or worse, when it was supposed to be broken. In Ilum, I instinctively tried to block the probe droid's laser, and then my once broken saber was even more busted than before. It was still unusable, but now I couldn't open up a chest nearby since the game thought I was in combat or something. Had to reset. Great. Plenty often things would go awry in combat when in grab sequences or near ledges, and I've already shown the glitch that ruined my Terran Malakos fight for me, and discussed the many problems with the Trilla fight at the end. One more with the latter, however, was that after I succeeded in defeating Trilla, once again, my lightsaber is active during the cutscene, making this moment a little sillier. I can admit that holding up your saber to see through dark areas is cool, but it's kind of annoying how contextual it is. The brightness to light your way only triggers in certain situations. Even though some areas feel dark enough, he won't hold his saber above his head, he'll just block. That's all I have, but don't let the lack of quantity in that list fool you. The technical issues weren't fun and practically ruined some scenes on their own. I expect more of the same in Jedi Survivor. The only developer whom I expect a fully functioning product at launch or even four years later, is Nintendo, sadly, and I don't love praising Nintendo. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is a combination of many other games you've likely played, and at a glance, it might not look like it offers much. If you don't like Star Wars, then yeah, I'd say don't even bother. But that's really the case for all Star Wars games, though. Don't like Star Wars? Maybe don't play Knights of the Old Republic, but Dragon Age or Mass Effect instead. Maybe don't play Battlefront, but Battlefield or Call of Duty. Don't play Force Unleashed, but God of War or Devil May Cry. I can easily admit that I think this would be a good game if it was a totally different skin, swords instead of lightsabers, telekinesis instead of the Force, and so on, but I can also admit that it being a Star Wars game is part of the appeal. That's not a bad thing, though. For the past few years, I've been thinking how cool it would be for certain licenses to get games in as many genres as possible. Everyone fondly remembers the RTS Lord of the Rings and Star Wars games. Everyone fondly remembers the RPG Lord of the Rings and Star Wars games. Star Wars has had action, both family-friendly and more serious, as well as puzzle, racing, vehicle shooter, third- and first-person shooter, and so on. To see a take on the Metroid and Souls-like genres, sure, that's awesome. Now give me a dedicated stealth game, standalone Pazak card battler, some kind of Sims-like, a Jabba the Hutt-esque property manager game, maybe some sports titles, and even an open-world Ubisoft game. Oh shit, that last one is happening. Sick. My point is, if this was released alongside, say, three other different types of Star Wars games, I doubt people would have the same perspective on it. 
but I think that goes both ways. As much as I like it, I have to admit, because it's the only single-player Star Wars game of the time, there are surely people out there who convinced themselves that it was good because they were so starved of a new game with this license. It's a weird situation. Basically, I'm saying nobody has the right attitude about it except for me. I'm the only one who sees through the lies of the Jedi. If you aren't with me, then you're my enemy. Other Star Wars quotes and references. Aren't I such a nerd? Wow, how unique am I to speak in Star Wars lingo? That'll do it for me. I'm done. Hope you all liked my take on this game. If not, then go scomp yourself. If you did, maybe become a patron. Whoa, look at all these names on screen. Don't you want to join them? Maybe subscribe to the channel or share this video with 25 of your closest friends. Then they'll show it to their 25 friends and in a few cycles, we'll take over the world. All right, I'm being stupid. I'm done for real now. Oh, we are the valiant infantry. We are the alpha team with passion and camaraderie.